Um, I've got a bit of a dil dilemma because a lot of what I'm going to be talk to, talking about was covered in the previous session. Um, that's a good thing, and it's a big change from early foresighting forums. On the other hand, those bastards stole my thunder. <laughs> but um, I could just toss my um, presentation out the window, but there's a couple of pretty slides, and I, I paid a graphic designer for a couple of them, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, I'd like to start with a show of hands. The um, car on the left is a Tesla Model S. <laughs> you all knew that. The one on the right is a Nissan Leaf. Ignoring the fact that the Tesla costs three times as much as the Nissan, can you put up your hand if you'd rather own the Tesla? That's about three quarters of the room. Who'd rather own the Nissan? Okay, well, good for you because I know you probably put up your hand, the Nissan people, because you realised it was a trick question, but there's one respect at least in which the Nissan is a better car and Lachlan raised this in the previous session, that the, the Nissan comes with vehicle to grid capability so you can provide power when you get home and you, can, you don't have to have a home battery if you've got a Nissan Leaf. But from the resilience perspective, it also means you can provide power in a blackout. And how much better would it be? Oh, let's see if I can work this. Work this. Um, if Osgrid, for instance, had a contract with Uber to supply 100 autonomous Nissan Leafs to supply power to a street that's had a blackout for an evening while the uh, repair crews are doing their thing. However, there are some problems which uh, even 100 Nissan Leafs can't fix, and this is where we come to resilience. We need to plan not only for short-term outages, but for managing the accelerating impacts of the unfolding climate crisis. And that means not only heat waves, uh, not only bushfires, but heat waves, cyclones and storms and floods. We need to build a more resilient energy system and distributed energy resources, DER, have an important role to play in that process. That's my first kind of key message. So, I mean, I guess you all know what DR are. It's not just solar batteries and EVs. Behind the meter, it's, it's about energy efficiency and demand management. But in front of the meter on the distribution network, it's about virtual power plants and peer-to-peer -peer trading and community batteries, solar gardens, there's a whole range of resources that are available there on the supply and the demand side. And what do I mean by resilience? There's two kind of quite distinct meanings the first one is the ability of a system to withstand and then recover from a shock and return to its original state. And that tends to imply um, toughness. And we've seen that in the way that AEMO has approached um, the bushfire crisis and they're calling for a, a, a hardening of the grid. That's the quote, quote from AEMO, harden the grid. The other definition of um, or meaning of resilience is more related to flexibility and it's about redesigning a system to adapt to a new reality and in my view DR are well placed to perform this second function and that's just the physical system there are other dimensions of resilience that we can possibly get into later institutional um, economic behavioral especially resilience is as much as anything about a different mindset and we need to start thinking about how to develop that over the past year, my work, which is funded by ECA, has focused increasingly on this problem of resilience. Here's two examples. The first on the left is a discussion paper I authored with Renew, uh, which came out in September last year. And the second one is a workshop which will be held in this very room on the 6th of April with Energy Networks Australia and ANU. And if anybody uh, would like an invitation, uh, please let me know afterwards and I'll make sure you get one. There's still some places available. I'm particularly interested in the role that DR, such as SAPs, standalone power systems and microgrids, can play in helping us to adapt to a new, more chaotic world. This is partly for practical economic reasons, but also because DER can help to address the trust issue that's the subject of this panel. 
People give three main reasons for investing in DER. The third one is the environmental benefits. Oh dear, I am in trouble. I have to speak slower, apparently. <laughs> The first reason they give is uh, about money, but the second one is around control and independence. And why would people want more control and independence? It's certainly not because they're all energy geeks. We know that from you know, the presentations yesterday. It's because they don't trust the system and they want to take power into their own hands. So this brings me to my next slide, which is the graphic design one. Oh, we don't need to see Malakuta again. Sorry, I'm forcing you to look at a slide that I was hoping to avoid. Um, this is my kind of unscientific summary of recent research from Australia and the US about who, how much we trust different levels of society. And everyone has now seen that the, the only thing that we trust more than ourselves is our dogs. Am I right? Good. Cats, I'm not so sure about. And I, I think we'd all agree that the energy industry, including you know, all of us, would be kind of down there towards the bottom right-hand corner of this graph. But DR, by definition, are up the top left-hand corner, and they can help us to kind of work on trust and sort of extend the circle of trust, especially if we can do things in community rather than individually. My catchword for that is trust is local. But resilience is not all about DR. As I see it, there are basically three options for increasing energy system resilience. We can go off-grid, we can go local, or we can go centralised. And we've just started to think about what might be the appropriate balance of these three dimensions of energy system resilience. I've been told to stop. Can I have one more minute? Yes. Thanks. OK, great. Um, Obviously, there are problems if we go to one extreme or the other, as we heard in the previous session. If we go too much towards off-grid, we create a kind of two-tier energy system with people who can afford it, buying their own resilience and everyone else being left to kind of shoulder the burden of the collective grid. If we go too far to the other end of the spectrum, we invest in these very expensive, lumpy, long-term assets in transmission and interconnection that can kind of make, swamp the market and make it very difficult to invest in more flexible and potentially cheaper local solutions, reflecting my bias here, obviously. Um, and so finally, I did want to get to my Mad Max slide. Um, this is a kind of epitome of the sort of chaotic man eat, I was going to say man eat dog, uh, dog eat dog, chaotic world of uh, catastrophic climate change that we all want to, want to avoid. But the flip side, of this dystopian vision is that crises often bring out the best in people. We want to be altruistic, we want to trust others, we want to help others, and we want to work with others. Sometimes we do manage to pull it off. We've seen that in the bushfires. So it's possible that the unfolding climate crisis will bring out the best in us, that it will make us better people and a better country than we are at the moment. The first step, of course, as with AA, is to collectively acknowledge that we have a problem. In this case, hi, my name is Australia and I'm a coalaholic. <laughs> and, that, and that it's a problem that affects all of us, even if we can't vote, or if we can't pay power bills, or if we can't even speak, like the koala. So it's one that we can only fix together. And in our view, the new energy compact is a mechanism that we can use to kind of make this journey together. Thank you. Thank you.